Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, we're gonna bounce around and get some plants in the ground, talk about some fun plants that are blooming right now, get underway planting our annuals and some perennials and possibly some pruning in this video. I don't know, we have just a ton going on here. It's kind of crunch time. Uh, this is our, right. we're right here at our average last frost date in our Raleigh, North Carolina garden. And we have a ton of things. We started from seed, uh, some things we've purchased as some perennial, some annual, uh, and then shrubs sitting all over the place. We've gained a lot of space. If you've been following along with the channel, we've gained a lot of space here. Uh, so we have the opportunity to put some more interesting things into this garden and rescue a few things that are a little crowded in the garden, that kind of thing. So lots of projects going on. One of the things we're gonna do here, uh, there's a patio going in where I'm standing. The screenings were added almost a year ago and the stone is sitting here and the brick's sitting here for this patio. Uh, it's going in soon, but the, uh, before we get to that, we need to get all these annuals and perennials in the ground. So the next two weeks, tons of things going in the ground. This back border along where this patio is going to be has been annuals for three years. And we're gonna kind of convert a couple of spaces in the garden from annuals over to perennials. This uh, Salgoon series of salvia, which they come low, I say low and compact, but this for salvia, two feet is kind of low and compact. Uh, we have five different colors of Salgoon salvia back here. They're all called Lake something. As an example, that's one I have in my hand, it's called Lake Tahoe. It's a darker purple color. We're gonna then, um, after these are planted, put in a few Agastache as well. Uh, and this space will now be a space where the plants are gonna come back you know, year over year. We waited on this particular one to see if they would come back from last year and they did. Uh, there's one right here that's up and looking pretty good and it's already a foot and a half tall uh, at this point here in, mi in middle April. So confident these are gonna come back every year. They're fantastic for the pollinators. This combination of this salvia with the Agastache will, ha will have just as many pollinators as we've ever had in this space. This is an important spot for us because we see it from the porch. These should be um, a little more showy than a couple of the annual borders we've put in here in the last couple of years and have pollinators on them all season. and all different kinds of pollinators. These salvia will bring in hummingbirds, native bumblebees, um, honeybees, pretty much any, any, uh, pretty much any pollinator that we'd want to lure into the garden. So we're Steph and I are going to put these in. The thing with the perennials, you know, when we when we do the annual border, I'll put all new compost across the whole border. But this morning, I'm just going to put a little bit of a compost and pine bark mix for each pot. I'm just gonna do about a half a shovel full for each one and then we're gonna sink them in the ground. So there ends up being 11 of these Salgoon salvia along this strip now. Uh, and we paid for these normally, you know, we start tons of things from seed here and we're trying to save money, but even though we spent about $50, which is still pretty good really because we went to big bloomers, it's <laughs> still, still a pretty good price, but we did spend a little more than we normally do, but these are our perennial, so we won't have to spend the money again. This has been a combination of compost and pine bark for three years. Uh, we're leaving the pansies in place for now. They can stay here for another month, although it was 90 yesterday and they're not gonna be too happy unless we're giving them some water at this point. We're gonna leave them for now. When they start to fade, uh, which you know, they're not particularly great as it is because the rabbits were eating them all winter. But anyway, what, what, once they come out, we're actually gonna mulch this strip rather than the bark and compost that we've had here. Steph is in the process of cutting back uh, daffodils uh, that have faded at this point. She's just cutting back the flower stalks, leaving the foliage in place. You're, you, uh, she's, leaving, right, she's leaving the foliage up on them. And there's a few that still have flowers on them, so just leaving, leaving those, but just deadheading them. We, the other thing we'll deadhead is these uh, Salgoon salvia came out of a greenhouse and they're trying to bloom already. They're butted up. And there you go. She'll just take the flowers off the top of them. But these all summer flowering perennials, 
we like to deadhead them when we put them in the ground because if you do cut them like that, they'll branch. It slows the top growth down, forcing them to root down in the ground or, or allowing them time to root down in the ground before they're trying to flower. And then they branch. So when they do come back into flower in a couple of weeks, they'll have multiple flowers where there was just one uh, stalk of flowers. So there you go. We're com this is a conversion from an annual bed into a perennial border. And if you're following along with the channel, by midsummer, this is just going to be a wave of five different colored flowers. The only reason the Agastache is not going in the ground is because it's small. We did them from seed. When you're doing perennials from seed, a couple things. Number one, there's a lot of the perennials, not all, not all, but a, a lot of the perennials are much slower from seed. Also, the first year you do them from seed, some, you know, in your, at your own house and you're putting them in the ground, this will not be the best year for those Agastache, but they'll go to sleep this next winter, come back up and be part of this border uh, in a bigger, better, fuller way next year. So let's jump into the next project. In the last couple of videos, I've been trying to get these uh, border plants, the the screening plants behind me under control a bit. So I pruned back the lower petalum pretty hard, pruned back the uh, osmanthus fragrance pretty hard. We had had things tucked up under them a little bit too much and we've rescued another one plant I'll show you in just a minute that's already looking better because of it. Uh, but I had to come in here and kind of cur carve out a spot under this osmanthus fragrance. You can see the ladder still over there. So that the plants that are here can perform a bit better. This is an autumn fire on Corazelia. It's just incredibly compact. Uh, and it's a, little, it's a little thinner than it would be if I had it in a bit more sun. This is one of those uh, cautionary tales about, you know, we, we all know azaleas are for shade, just what we've all, always known. But these Encore azaleas, for the most part, need more sun than their, uh, you know, the old, the old fashioned azaleas. This one's been in a hair too much shade. You can see every flower and every branch sticking out that direction because I had to plant, you know, this far over top of it. That was my issue. I've got it cut back. After it flowers, I'll give it a bit of a haircut. And if it balances itself back out more, I'll leave it here and just keep carving this out. If not, I may move it, slide it a little further up in the bed. But Autumn Fire is a fantastic plant. If you're looking for a low compact evergreen azalea uh, that repeat blooms, I don't think there's a better one really than, than, than fire just for this incredibly uh, compact habit. The other thing is I can see, here's an agapanthus that's coming back. And you can see it really wants to go in this direction <laughs> like that. The, even the hosta, even the hosta had decided it was too much shade and it's pointing out that direction. When the hostas are telling you it's too shady, you know, you, know, you definitely know it's too shady. This is Deer Dolores hydrangea. This is a big leaf hydrangea. And this is one of the remontant ones that repeat blooms. It is absolutely loaded with flower buds. I pruned this one just to shape in a video a month or so ago. These aren't ones you prune uh, in the late winter, but you can come in and clean them up. And that's what I did. I just cleaned off last year's flowers off of it. I didn't do any cutting down in the rest of the plant. So I didn't sacrifice any flowers, but I did clean it up enough that look how perfectly round this plant is. And every single terminal end has a flower bud. This thing's gonna be completely blue blue or pink, depending on your soil type. But for us, they lean toward a lighter blue uh, in, this, in this garden, uh, which is per perfectly fine with me. I don't mind them if they're pink or purple or blue or whatever shade they come out in. They're all still beautiful. Uh, but this is a fantastic variety. This one was blooming, I think, there's probably video of it September, October of last year. It was blooming that late into the season. It'll come into full flower and just be completely covered in flowers. And then after that, it'll just have a consistent one, two, uh, one, two on it the rest of the season. Uh, and then here's the azalea that I rescued from that shady space over there. And already I can tell it wants to be fuller. This is autumn lily. Autumn lily has the, is white, but it has the occasional flower that has a pink or purple stripe in it. It's super, super interesting. This one also stays incredibly compact, but again, I had it in a little too much shade over there, and so it was stretching a bit. Again, as soon as it finishes flowering, I'll come in here and take some of these longer limbs off of it that are reaching, uh, and uh, it'll flush back out and be 
and be completely full. But you see, that's that, that's that stripe in the flower, which makes this one really interesting. It has that, probably one out of 10 flowers has that stripe on it, which is more, I guess, more purple than, than anything. I, I really, Autumn Lily is incredibly striking. And it does a good job, I have found, of eating its own flowers. I say this weirdly because some people don't like white because sometimes white flowers can become brown on the plant and then linger on them. And, and Delaware Valley White was always kind of famous for that. For like a week or two after it finished flowering, it just kind of was clinging to the flowers. And I've noticed that on Lily, like they drop off and they're just, they're just kind of gone. Uh, and the plant is back to being you know, just this perfect little evergreen. So if you're, in, if you're worried about white flowering azalea not looking great after it flowers, a uh, lily kind of solves that problem a bit. A lot of the pruning we're doing in the garden right now is on spring flowering things as they finish. If I need to prune them, you don't have to prune anything. And there's a lot of plants that you won't see me prune, you know, in the garden at all because they stay, you know, they stay pretty orderly on their own. But there are a few things we're size controlling for various reasons and other things that will stretch a bit because we've got them in a little too much shade or whatever. Uh, and I think that that one thing about this Miss Lemon Abelia is I've got it in a hair more shade. It looks great in the part shade, uh, but this one is stretching a bit more. It's getting a bit bigger than it would if I had it out in the full sun in the front garden or over here, you know, slide it over that way in a little more sun. So I can see, you know, just how it's stretching a bit here in the early season. These are summer flowering uh, and I'm getting a little late to be pruning them. I can still prune Abelia and it would still flower. It just pushed the flowers way later into the summer, but I can go, in, I, I don't want to do any general pruning on it, but there are a few limbs that are sticking way out above everything else, like that one that I'd like to get down into the plant. And I can see some of this new growth is popping up on it, but it's quick, it's quick and easy just to follow these down into the plant a bit and, and take them off with a small pair of pruners. Uh, they actually break off pretty easy and that's not the way I'm going to do it, but you'd be surprised that, you know, you can reach down in the plant below the top of the top of it and prune them off pretty easy. And then this is, you know, maybe this is one of those jobs you come out, put your coffee cup down and prune it in five minutes and move on. And it's a whole, like a whole new plant for the rest of the, for the rest of the growing season. Can't really do anything wrong here unless I cut it off down at the <laughs> below the ground or something. But there's not really much that I could do that would hurt it. I'm trying to keep a kind of an open form on it. I don't want to meatball it. Uh, I'm going to miss one. I always get a comment down below that one drove me crazy. <laughs> Sometimes I'm just talking too much and I don't see. There's always one I miss. There'll be a couple more that'll pop up in the next few weeks that aren't currently sticking up and I'll do it again real quick. But this thing will bloom all summer once it gets started. Moving a few of our conifers around this evening, we like to wait. This is where temperatures have jumped up into the 80s now, and we like to wait until the evening to move things around, uh, especially things like conifers. And this, uh, you know, they're not a, they're not a big root system on a lot of the things that are in this garden because they're relatively new. And we started with sm very small containers on a lot of things, especially this one I'm about to talk about. We had planted a bunch of stuff here along the foundation for the winter have dug those things out and now we're in the process of rearranging things here in the foundation and we thought it was just kind of funny that the charlie boy quarter line was in the ground here during the winter i dug it out and now frankie boy is taking the place of charlie boy this uh, 
uh, in most books is uh, Thuja Orientalis, Frankie Boy. But that genus is actually changed to Platycatus. So it's Platycatus Orientalis, Frankie Boy. This is a really neat little conifer. If you look at the other uh, Oriental Thujas, is the common name for them. Uh, most of them have these like plates going around. You know, the, the foliage is very unique. You, you, you'll absolutely know one when you see it uh, once you've identified it. This is completely different. This is like a threadleaf version of one. Uh, it can be sheared pretty close and be a very formal looking, really tight growth habit plant. And if you find some photos of this online, that's what you're gonna see is where people are shearing them. We kind of want it just to have an open, just kind of the, the look it would just naturally have without all that shearing on it. We had it crowded over here next to a boxwood and it's uh, next to one of the better boxwoods. We're gonna be talking about better boxwood in a video coming up in the next few days. Um, we've gotten some growth on ours. They've been in the ground for a year. Excited to talk about those, but this is now in a good location. It's gonna get plenty of sunlight in the morning. It's gonna take a little bit of afternoon shade because we are on the southern edge of where a lot of these conifers wanna be. This one's hardy in zone six to, I'm gonna say six to eight or five to eight. Um, but with in parentheses nine, that's what I'm going to put on the screen. Uh, so like in the Pacific Northwest nine, but probably not in the Southeast nine, if that makes any sense. But great plant, uh, you know, it's one of those one of those conifers you just can't uh, not touch in the garden. Then uh, stuff will back up. We we've had that, and I talked about this in a video the other day. The Texas Baccata, uh, that's a gold version of Texas Baccata. We got that one from uh, Ted Stevens down at Nurseries Caroliniana. I don't know if it's available on their website or not. Uh, sometimes when I say those things and, and they're not there about the time, you know, plants sell very quickly online and anywhere this time of year. So saying something is anywhere is not necessarily accurate. But it's a very, it's a beautiful conifer. It was gonna outgrow the space up toward the front of the bed. So we just took it from the front of the bed and slid it back. Even there, it will get too tall. Of course, the gold version of that is going to grow slower than an all green version, but no matter what, it'll go up above this window in time. So at some, it has a lifespan in the bed that's probably 15, 18 years. So who cares? <laughs> you know, it'll be it'll be fine. We might shear this at some point if it starts to get a little bit too big on us. But this can be held three to four feet by three to four feet pretty easily. And it'll be just a little wispy piece back here. It's grass-like, so anytime the breeze is blowing, it'll be moving around, which is something we're kind of lacking in this garden. This garden is very rigid in a lot of ways, and there's not a lot of things that move around in the wind. Uh, so it's kind of nice to have something like this out here. We're gonna jump over now and um, put some annuals in the ground. We're about to plant some annuals along the edge of the front walk out here. And before we did, I thought we'd talk about the Rose's Blush Blueberry. Uh, this is a, a native blueberry. I use that loosely because a, a lot of times now people go native, 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 but it's not really native to Wake County, North Carolina. This is a plant that's native to the Gulf Coast of the United States. So is it a native plant? You got bumblebee thinks so. Our, our native bumblebee definitely thinks uh, this is a native plant. I got several bees on it right now. Flowers are just starting to open. The same kind of droopy flowers you would expect uh, on a blueberry. Uh, this one again is native to the Gulf Coast. Has a really compact habit. Uh, this one was selected because it has this incredible blush colored new foliage that kind of matures to a blue green, really narrow uh, pinnate uh, foliage. It's super interesting. These flowers come in really dense clusters. This is the most it's flowered. It's been three years in the ground. So a lot of times that's about the time it takes for something to to show you what it's really gonna be in the garden. And it's things got just absolutely loaded with flowers. The bees are working on pollinating them now. They'll produce blueberries. It's a blueberry, uh, but they're smaller than what we'd have as commercial blueberries in the stores. They're more what native blueberries were before humans got involved and started breeding them. Uh, so we just let the birds have them, but they are completely edible just like any other blueberries. This is a 12 month plant. Uh, it's always doing something. It's always interesting. The bark on it's beautiful. Keeps this kind of three by three habit. In the, in the wild, these will colonize. So you know, any pruning I do on the top of this plant is going to produce suckering and that suckering can you know 
suckering plants can get out of control sometimes in the future. So if we see any suckering down here below it, we'll cut them out in the future. Uh, no big deal. But really, really love this plant. There's a full video on it on the Garden Plants with Jim Putnam channel, uh, Roses Blush Blueberry. Uh, and I could show this plant off. This is one of the plants in the garden that if I showed you every single month of the entire year, you would find I would find something interesting to say about it and you would find it interesting as well just because it's always doing something but we're caught right now we're caught in this peak pink bud that opens to a white flower with kind of a pink new growth and this blue older foliage on it and it's just super super striking here in the garden you can see we have all kinds of projects going on here in the Raleigh garden one that I have coming up though that I'm a little anxious about is I'm gonna move that Arborvitae is on the corner right there back toward the house. And I've waited a little late. You, you see me pulling things out of the ground all the time and giving them away, selling them, pull, uh, moving them all over the place like chess pieces all the time. But there's the occasional plant that slows me down just a bit and I have to think about a little bit more. I, we, our days have jumped back up into the 80s. It's a little abnormally dry right now, so I wanna water that thing in well. I wanna water the spot where it's going well, and I'm gonna wait until the temperature moderates, which it's supposed to do this weekend. It's supposed to be back in the 60s uh, daytime temperatures. Chance of some cloudy weather, so I'm hoping to move it back then. I wish I'd have done it a month ago, uh, but we just weren't in a position. We didn't have the foundation painted. We didn't have some of these things done, but it's the only plant of all the plants we're moving, and we're moving a bunch, that I'm at slightly apprehensive about the 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 uh, the maple, the red maple that was originally here is the gift that keeps on giving. Dug up a big giant root from it, but it's finally breaking off now, and not you know it was they were alive up until recently. So it's nice to be able to now that they're cracking and coming out. But this is even four years, four years after that red maple came out of the ground. Here we are uh, with this. So Steph is going to go over the annuals that we added along this pathway coming in. And we may change this pathway out at some point, but she can tell you more about that. Some of the things in an old house have a little bit of history and you don't necessarily need to change everything. This pathway is the, the original pathway to the front door from the driveway. And this house is over 75 years old now. So this is a really old pathway. And so we'll find use for these stones somewhere else, these um, pavers, because uh, I do love the vestiges of, of what came before. So we'll, we'll definitely reuse them, and, but at some point it's going to be maybe a small retaining wall that, that flutes out or um, with some, you know, like um, river, what are they called? Slates? River? Well, river slates? No, you go, go ahead. Give me some no, more guesses. I'm not good at that. You know that. Flagstone? Flagstone. She did. Oh, yeah. I usually let her go a while. Yeah, yeah. And, then, yeah, and then he laughs at me for a while while I, I never yeah, get yeah. it. But right. anyway, so flagstones are something to some steps. Um, uh, but for now, we're going to keep the pavers here. And we decided to have a little bit of a, a hot garden. We've got cool colors in the front. So you won't really see these so much, except for from the, from the steps, and we really, we'll really like it like that. But, but you'll see the cool colors playing off the cool color of the house. And that was my original aim uh, in choosing this. Just this, something different, just trying to like uh, mix it up a little. But I'm just gonna real quickly tell you the plants that we chose. Uh, we always have summer jewel salvia. Uh, we have a little less this year, but we still love it. It's great for the pollinators. Uh, I think it's pretty showy. Jim somewhat thinks it's showy, depending on his mood. I don't know. Well, the, red, the red is showy. The red is super showy. It's sort of a fire red. It's a candy apple red. So it does, it blazes. And um, the pollinators absolutely adore it. So made a strip of those we did from seed. Those completely we did from seed, which I love. And then this strip is just a mix of, of um, more hot colors. The um, The... The shorter zinnias, we've got a yellow, a double yellow. We've got a yellow with a, a red um, center to it. We've got celosia that is a dwarf celosia, so it should only grow about six, inch, six inches or so. We've got that in orange and yellow. We've got coleus to play off of those, adding a little bit of a pink in there as well. I love a good coleus to sort of give a zappa color. I, I will say, um, if we were willing to wait, we probably could have transplanted a million celosias because we've used it enough where 
it comes up everywhere. Um, this year, I'm determined I'm going to like not allow it. I, I plants to me, once they're there, they deserve to be there. <laughs> <laughs> which can maybe drive somebody crazy <laughs> but um, yeah. um, so we're going to pull out the melon podium that is going to come up everywhere and the celosia this year but these dwarf ones that we've got around here will be really pretty and and really the pollinators love that as well so it's a great combination i'm looking forward to seeing how it grows we had amended these two spots in the past with soil cube compost and this time around, I actually did a mixed uh, compost and pine bark. That's what I actually put out here. I found a bag that was like 50% pine bark and 50% compost, just trying to get some drainage in this area. What I do is I play back and forth. Uh, I want to put most of these annuals in a lot of organic material, same thing as our vegetable garden, because they really thrive in that. They don't really thrive in our mulched beds or our wood chip beds or triple shredded hardwood beds are, you know, those kind of places. They thrive in really rich organic areas and we only have about six or eight months with them, six to seven months with them. So we want to get all we can out of them. But I play back and forth season to season. If I dig down and I feel like I've gotten to the point where it's so organically rich that it might stay a little wet uh, when we're watering it, I'll add some bark. I'll add some pine bark soil conditioner to it. If I feel like we've got a bed as an example in the back garden, where I've gone too heavy on the bark and I think it's gonna to drain too well. You can see it. You can really, you can see it when you dig, how dry it is. Then I'll add more compost. And so that's, that's kind of how I judge back and forth, season to season, trying to find a balance between the two where we can keep some moisture, but it not be wet. So this is annual bed number two, mm -hmm. uh, I think so far, so far, and we have several more to go, lots of things that we've purchased we've done from seed. And so those will be in upcoming videos. Uh, thanks for following along with it.